So weird. All right. So on that note, um, uh, Dan asked me to run the meeting today. I think he had a conflict, an unavoidable conflict for today. Um, so uh, this is uh, the 26th of September meeting on a Wednesday, and this is the Kube Conformance Work Group. Thanks for everybody for attending. I did put a link to the Google Doc that has the agenda in the chat. Uh, if you don't have it, you can ask me, and I'll post it again. Um, I'm going to go look at, uh, looks like people are adding their names in for the attendees. Um, and let's see the agenda. So the first person on the agenda is Doug, and it's a question about the frequency of the calls. So Doug, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so this topic actually does tie into the next one. So I, don't be surprised if they kind of get merged together a little. But I was thinking that with the amount of activity going on, at least recently relative to conformance, some of the PRs that have been submitted and stuff. Um, I feel like we need to have more often than monthly phone calls uh, just to get everybody in sync on the same page and make sure that we're all headed in the same direction. And so I'm wondering what people thought about changing the frequency of the calls to be at least weekly for the time being until we run out of things to talk about and then we could stagger it more. All right, so that's that. Oh, that's neat. <laughs> was that one of the robots? I think it may have been. <laughs> It's trying to take over. Tim, your hand is raised. So oh, yeah. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense as someone who has way too many meetings uh, already. <laughs> uh, maybe <laughs> I, this, it, it might be slightly selfish, but I also think it's it's in earnest because um, I, I think this group is responsible for the higher level picture and objective, but not necessarily the low level execution other than to verify it. I think periodically, and that's part of what those other meetings on, on SIG Arch, as well as you know, folks when we talk during SIG testing, we kind of go back and forth on these topics, uh, and and that's part of the, also the reason why I put up the separate team for notification on PRs and issues. You could just slash CC at the team, so that way we can all stay informed. Uh, now, do I think monthly is enough? I, I. I, I struggle to find a balance there. Uh, yeah, um, so I think weekly might be too much is, is yeah. just probably what I'm saying. Okay. Doug, um, go ahead, yeah. Doug. yeah, so and this, this is the part where it kind of leads into the next topic, which is, um, and this, this could just be me. So if it is me, just tell me to go away. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a little confused about the relationship between us and SIG architecture because I kind of was assuming that we were responsible for producing the conformance docs and, and, and setting up the testing and automation, all their stuff, everything that you know, we're doing right now. And that SIG architecture would be like it is with other groups within Kubernetes, which are they're more of an oversight committee, right? Make sure people are going the right direction, have questions to be answered, they go to SIG ARC. Now we may be slightly different in the sense that uh, SIG architecture has more of a formalized approval process. In particular, we know that they approve our, our uh, upgrading of tests and performance tests and stuff like that. But if, if it's as you described, Tim, which is SIG ARC is where kind of like the work gets done, then I'm kind of confused as to what we do. Because I, I, I thought it was almost the exact opposite, right? Well, we do the work. If some of those guys from SIG ARC are interested in our stuff, then they'll join our phone calls. But we really only talk to SIG ARC when we need their input on something or review on something. And so I'm kind of confused as about the relationship here. Uh, so in our little readme for the working group, it says that the charter of this working group is to define the process around certifying Kubernetes conformance. But it's SIG architecture that owns the definition of conformance. So a lot of the process discussion and, and Google Docs stuff that you've seen flying around has been us trying to refine that definition and describe how to refine that definition. And then finally, SIG testing is the place where we work on the mechanics of how the conformance tests like, work. So I, I share your question. I'm not, which to me goes back to, I'm not sure that a weekly uh, cadence makes a lot of sense for this group. I have historically viewed this meeting as a useful checkpoint to report back progress on the higher level, bigger picture perspective. I have a meta point where like over time, 
as we start to, because William is not here, but uh, at least I don't see him here. Uh, but he had originally defined the idea over time of starting to approach different aspects of conformance through profiles, right? But we haven't even really, we haven't even really gotten there, right? Like we need to deal with just the base and get that done and get it cleaner and more hardened. Uh, we've kind of spun the drain uh, several times on the details around it. And I think we just need to execute on that piece first and then revisit the process for profiles once we actually have the first step done. Right. So, 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 so I agree with you. I definitely don't want more phone calls. I guess part of it is, um, Aaron, you, you there mentioned sort of we now have three different groups, if I got that right. We have this group. SIG architecture and then SIG testing, and each one of them sort of have a different set of responsibilities for the in, in the complete picture. And it's not clear to me, as I'm looking to schedule my week and my wonderful list of phone calls that I have to join, which one I need to join when for what particular topic. And I guess part of my push was for having a weekly call here was to try to get those conformance discussions into just one meeting as opposed to spread across potentially three meetings. And maybe that's the wrong approach, but that's kind of where my head was at. So I'm open to other ideas to, to resolve it, but I'm just looking for something that says, I don't need to track three different, forgive me for using the wrong term, working groups. Just yeah. to just talk about conformance. Yeah, this, this is a deeper question from Bobby. Actually, I have a similar concern as well. You know, Doug, uh, I think you, you brought it up. This is a very good point because there's a lot of activity going on. So we, we need to, I mean, at least in this working group though, at least we need to summarize, you know, what's going on because there might be an impact on the way we're doing conformance now. The current, it may, may even impact our current certification status as well though. So, so either, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What, is the, what is the sheer volume of activity that is going on that is overwhelming you guys? Well, I think the, the, I look at the PRs and all the documents kind of going on in the, I think the document which you published, uh, Aaron, so there's a lot of things, uh, I mean, I, I know they are very relevant. I'm not uh, questioning that, but I think so at least maybe, I don't know, not weekly meeting or maybe bi-weekly bi -weekly meeting, but at least kind of summarize, is there a, like a uh, impact, major impact on the end, end user, like a uh, company wise, you know, like. So I, I've seen content. like, I've definitely seen a lot of engagement around that one document, which has been discussed at SIG Architecture on a weekly basis as we look to refine the definition of what conformance is. I'm curious what other PRs have been crossing your radar or that have been necessary to cross your radar that you're finding you're, you're not able to keep up with. Well, so, I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say for me, it's, it's less about the specific work items because you're right, right now, there may not be a long list of things to track. For me, it's more of the, what don't I know is going on? Right? So, for example, if something comes up in SIG testing related to conformance, how do I know that? Right? Do I now need to monitor their agenda doc, join their meetings just in case something comes up? That's I may not be able to turn SIG architecture all the time. So, so do I need to check I, their agenda doc before every single meeting to see if something might come up there? That's, that's the part that worries me, is the unknown. That's why I created the teams. So that way, when we, have, when we need global notification for something that does cut across horizontally, you can add the team and then the team will be globally notified. Uh, you know, obviously I, I, at this stage of the game of being involved in Kubernetes for, uh, I don't know, Liz, like four human years, what is it, <laughs> dog years? I don't even know yeah. uh, that like filtering and separation of concerns is something that I often invoke just because I, I can't be involved in everything. There's just too much noise. So be, using jurisprudence of when to add the team and when not to is usually the way I operate. Yeah, so I, I guess I have tried to operate as a liaison between those sundry groups because like I, I have to attend state testing on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and I show up here as sort of the, the touch point to make sure that concerns are being raised and addressed appropriately. I think this group's concerns probably are more overlapped with um, SIG architecture. If you have a lot of, like Brad went on an epic, I don't even know how many minute rant about profiles and fragmentation where like we were all in violent agreement and it took us about 20 minutes to realize that fact in SIG architecture. And that was more about the what is conformance when it comes to a definition perspective. And I agree, like this group has a lot of opinions there, but that's the forum to discuss it, right? This is like, when it comes time to do profiles, how are we going to 
run through the process of certifying profiles. Right. Um, so, there was a lot of time and energy spent here around like the legal framework mm -hmm. and the language of certification, right? So I, your hand yeah, I, I think I mentioned uh, somewhere also that the SIG architecture is coming up with the documentation saying, go do this and we'll all endeavor to do the things in the document in some form or fashion in one SIG or the other. Uh, it, it definitely, it's not going to be in one spot. It's going to be spread over uh, different areas. Uh, so, and as long as the people who are actually doing the work uh, use the correct labels and notify the correct mailing list and attend the meetings, I think we should be fine. Um, so that that's the way I, I see it. And we are not yet, there are some thoughts in there. It's a living document. We, this is a distillation of the things that happened over the last uh, couple of months, uh, if not more. So those are, it contains the learnings from running the conformance tests across, uh, you know, including the OpenStack provider, the AWS ones, and all the new people who are reporting stuff to test grade. Uh, so uh, please, you know, treat it that way and not as like, um, oh my God, what is happening kind of thing, please. Well, I think, yeah, I think what we are hey. saying is just to kind of summarize. Deepak, yeah, I think maybe stand up first. Oh, yeah. No yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I just had, I guess, two, two questions. One is more of a, a technical one, a process kind of question for Tim. You had mentioned um, when there is a topic like a PR or something that comes up that, conform, that, that concerns this working group, that they should tag it with the slash conformance WG team, whatever. Um, just as a, just from my understanding, how do you guys actually manage that? Because I, I suspect I'm on the team. Uh, actually, maybe I'm not, I don't know. But if, let's assume I am. I'll then obviously get a GitHub email about that. But how do I know that that is related to conformance as opposed to all the other you know thousands of emails I get a day from GitHub? How do you guys manage that? <laughs> so I, I, have, I have filters for filters that have filters. It's the at team mentioned and then what the team is. So it's like, uh, it's not pretty. What I've created over the past four years is not is a Rube Goldberg machine for GitHub notification. Filter. I would love for you to share that with us at some point, Tim, because I think it's not a it's not a pretty thing. It's not even like consistent. I have that so sounds many like a, that sounds like the rest of open source. Dude. I don't want to share it because I have to clean up all these hacks first. <laughs> the fire hose guys. Uh, yeah, we all so have the same problem. The this other thing, thing is not unique here. So the other thing I was going to say is that. I have tried to use a, a label called area slash conformance, which is available in the test info repo where the testing stuff happens, the community repo where the doc stuff happens and the um, Kubernetes repo where the conformance tests are actually written. And then what we could do is have pull requests that automatically touch certain directories get automatically labeled with the area conformance label. We have the mechanisms in place to do that today for like, Docs that touch different SIGs directories automatically get labeled with that SIG. So it's not necessarily the same thing as a push notification, um, but it does give you a set of queries that you can run on a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever cadence makes sense for you to keep up with that volume of work. It's not quite as Rube Goldbergish as Tim's method. And so that's why he created the team to try and be more of a push notification, especially to try and raise the bat signal if it seems like we really need folks' attention but that's not as easy to automatically apply as labels are. Okay, so that helps me a little, thank you. Then let me get to my second question, which is, I like concrete examples to wrap my head around things. So Aaron, since you brought, or maybe it was Tim, somebody brought up the notion of the profiles. Um, so when we actually sit down and have a discussion about whether we need profiles at all, where does that discussion happen? Is that- That's here. Working? That it is here, okay. That is here. So like we would define what does it mean for a profile to be conformant and what is the process by which, and then we would have to go back and get that okayed by Arch, right? Like it'd be like, what is the process that we want to follow for defining X? And then they'd be like, okay, we, we can say that X makes sense, right? Um, so, it, it, and then how you certify it and how you do all the legal wrangling around it and what it means to be in and out of certification and all the other jurisprudence that's associated with it falls on our shoulders here in this group. 
uh, is that's, you know, it's definitely underneath Dan's purview for what it means to boot somebody out of certification, what it means to certify, et cetera. Okay, cool. Thank you. That, that's, the, that's the answer I was hoping to hear. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. And I would like, personally, I'd love to live in a world where we don't talk about profiles for a while because there's so much other functionality we need to cover first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, I agree. So, I, I would just use that as an example of a topic that I think that I want to get clarity on where it gets discussed. So thank you. So, right. So I cut off Deepak too. I apologize because uh, you had your hand raised up. So no, I think the, no, I think that's fine. I think they, uh, Doug pretty much covered everything. Yeah. So, uh, thanks. Okay. Back to you, Brad. So, oh yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, would it make sense twice a month? Is, is the problem, Doug, you're thinking once a month is, well, you, you wait a month and you feel like everything just kind of blindsides you because we only met once a month or we still feel, well, twice a month would be a little more frequency to, to have some discussion. I, I think from my point of view, it seems like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in SIGARC. And, you know, from my SIG doc responsibilities, I told them they wanted somebody to cover SIGARC anyway. So I said, well, I might as well go double dip, right? And cover for SIG doc and then cover since there's so much conformance discussion going on. That's kind of how I resolved to do it, which is to cover the two out of the three and just assume Aaron's got the whole testing thing covered. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think it's hard for somebody to come and show up and kind of get a clear view of, okay, what's done in the one group versus what's done in the other group, maybe because it's not well, well documented, maybe because it's just kind of tribal knowledge. And I don't know how to solve that beyond even myself just kind of going to both meetings. Yeah, I, to answer your question, Brad, I, I personally don't think once a month is very useful, to be honest. I think if you're only meeting once a month, it's almost not worth meeting at all, to be honest. And it's been my experience. That's why I would at least like every other week kind of thing, if nothing else, just to sync up verbally with everybody else about what's going on, what people think they should be working on, what things are going well, what things need attention. Because otherwise, I'm not sure how that happens I'm not sure what other mechanisms would make it as productive, put it that way. Uh, how, let me ask a different question. Uh, how are the people on this call actually helping with defining new test suites or uh, new features to be added to, uh, to basically the conformance uh, test suite? Uh, is that work happening here? Are the people here on this call discussing, okay, we need to add these kinds of tests and those kinds of tests are missing or this feature needs to be tested? Is, is that happening here or elsewhere? I would hope it would happen here. I don't think it's happened yet, but I'd like for it to happen here. I think that's where the, the, the whole clarity around what is process and what is uh, what just uh, uh, Dims uh, mentioned, actually. So I'm, I'm kind of confused as well. So when I think uh, Tim mentioned that uh, what we discuss in this working group is the process thing. So um, yeah, so profile obviously is one good example of that. But other than that, what just uh, Tim's uh, mentioned. Right, that is fact, the reason I'm asking is, it seems that so far this group has been doing the post work uh, in the sense that everything is done in the main KK repository. After that, people take that output and try to do something with it here. Uh, that is what I have seen I mean, I've heard at least uh, that this group is doing. Well, I mean, and if, if it needs to change uh, to say, okay, we are going to be full, fully invested in actually make driving changes to the uh, uh, test suite that is in main KK repository, then we should not, we should still, you know, do the separation of concerns that Tim was saying that we need to have like an actual SIG or a working group in Kubernetes and use this group the way it is currently is. So, so, so a little bit of history. One thing that we did do and take ownership for the first release is, you know, making sure that, you know, that the plan was to go document the tests. So once we did an analysis and said, okay, well, they, these are ones all labeled conformance and make sure they're labeled, you know, they were already labeled and they seemed like to make sense, they were the right tests. Somebody had to go in and add a little, all the descriptions that were in the spreadsheets and put them all into the code, right? So we did take some ownership there. I mean, I know myself personally did a, a large number of those trying to get, you know, some notion of a reference documentation for the tests. And so that's kind of where the split was before on the first release dim. So it seemed like, 
did, did we write end-to-end -end test? No. Were we trying to add the conformance piece, whether it was the, that, that window dressing of creating the references or, you know, the other thing, you know, the sauna buoy came up through this group, right? Those kinds of things. Um, those, all, those kinds of topics of, oh, we should use this for the, the document. That's what at least I remember, Tim, historically that we did. Yeah, there, there was a lot of individual things to get us ramped up and moving to get us to the point where we could have a means by which to have a process, right? right. And it was before it was kind of, there wasn't anything there. And some of us like Matt Liggett and myself actually did go and fix a bunch of tests mm -hmm. uh, and actually get a bunch of all the, all Matt Liggett did a lot of the original conformance stuff that exists now today. Right. And him and I worked on a bunch of the other mm -hmm. uh, the details with getting containers auto spun up and getting the information out so we could actually do certification because before it was just kind of a little bit hodgepodge -y. and you actually assisted on some of the introspective work to run the containers inside of the cluster versus external right so there's been a lot of uh, details and I think we can probably coordinate execution on some of these things if there's common awareness that you know these things exist so as a working group we don't we, we or as a because we're not really part of the Kubernetes project, we're kind of external to it. Um, right. That's that's why I was saying that, Tim. It's like it. I want us to be like, okay, we want to drive the change that we would like to see to happen, and not like be the per people who say, okay, don't do this, don't do that kind of thing, right? Um, yeah. So I mean, I want us to be proactive in uh, discussing the things that we need to drive and actually helping with making things happen. Like like a, a concrete example of one of the things I want to do is Matt Liggett and I, and Aaron brought it up in the last conversation too, is that uh, I don't want Heptio and I don't want uh, us to own the Kube conformance container. I want that to be published as a separate thing in the KK repo. So that way Sonobuy uses it. Sure, it's great. It's a way to run it, uh, but it's not, you know, we don't own it. And it's part of every release. So anybody can work on any version of it at any point in time. Uh, and that's the canonical location is in KK. That's one work item for sure that I want to accomplish and could use help on to get that done. Now there's other, there are other changes to the upstream test suite uh, that need to get made in order for us to be good stewards of other people's clusters, right? That have existed, that exist in different portions of the Sunnabuy repo, but they shouldn't. I have like the tag that says fix upstream in the Sonobuy repo, and I've just leave it as a backlog item because if I file it in KK, it's like lost in the noise. <laughs> no one's paying attention to it. Like one of the things that I wanted to do, just to get concrete examples, is auto labeling of, of the entire dependency chain of all the containers and everything else that gets spun from the test suite. So cleaning up is as simple as deleting a, a label selector because currently it spins a bunch of namespaces and the cleaning up uh, and the terminating can take a long time on foreign environments. Uh, and, you know, it's part of the end-to-end -end test suite uh, for auto running and test infra. You know, they just nuke the cluster at the end, so you don't care. But if you're running on somebody's environment, the, how long it takes to clean up and being good stewards in that environment matters a lot. So we need to make sure that we do those types of things. So I, I can come up with a list of action items that I know that I'm I could use help with <laughs> that I think would be good for the CNCF conformance effort, right? Uh, but I don't exactly know, you know, I could make the issues in KK and tag this team, right? That's one process that we could follow for how to get this stuff done. Um, but we didn't really have that team before. So before it just kind of lived, lived, lived in their own separate locations. Mm -hmm. But to, to Doug's specific question, I, you know, I don't know if we want to do thumbs up or thumbs down like we do in Sig Docs, but, you know, do, are people, is the majority of people thinking that meeting bi-monthly is too much? So uh, are you cringing uh, about that, DIMS or... Tim? I don't want to talk about uh, the frequency of meetings unless we actually put our foot to the ground and actually accomplish some stuff. If, uh, if, we, if we say we want to create and curate a backlog that, that we can execute right. on... Right. And then uh, I'm happy to help facilitate that because I have a backlog. I just think no one really cared. <laughs> before, right. Exactly. Know? So um, exactly, Tim. So we need to care about this. If we need to have a meeting, we can schedule meetings. Uh, I don't want it to just take up uh, meeting time just because you know 
Uh, yeah, for, for me, I'm trying to think of like, what is, what is it that you are trying to achieve, Doug, that reduced meeting cadence is impeding? So for, for me, it's like I said, a lot of it is I don't know where things are being discussed and I would like more discussions to happen within this working group. So for example, in my opinion, almost everything that was discussed in SIG architecture should have first been discussed within this group and then take our preferred answer to SIG architecture for approval. But again, that's with me not completely understanding the various roles. I would like to have these <coughs> discussions here talk about what are the things we want to do going forward. Tim mentioned he has a backlog of, backlog of things. It would have been nice if we had a regular meeting so that could have come up earlier so Tim could ask, do people want to see my backlog? Where should I put this backlog of work items so that people can know where to pick them off to so work on them? We discussed this last month where Tim really wished super hard for a backlog and I thought we were in agreement. We could, we could have Tim file issues here. Um, I also would love to put together a backlog from a fleshing out the, pers the definition of Kubernetes conformance perspective. Um, but first I need to like refine the definition so that I can then put down what our priorities are for filling things out. But we did loosely speaking have a discussion last month and got agreement from this group that we wanted to head in the direction of pod coverage. So I feel like we've, we've been covering and addressing the things you're talking about. And it could be the reason you're not hearing so many discussions this month is because we've been busy with other things. I, I don't know. From my perspective, I'm, at, I'm not really drowning in notifications related to conformance. I've been, I've had, like wrangling the conformance definition doc has been a lot of fun. And I hope to not have to go through that iteration again. I don't know how long it took Srinivas to put together the first iteration, but this feels like at least as, as long. Um, but I suspect that like we'll probably you'll probably hear more conversations as we ramp up to uh, KubeCon Shanghai, right? You've been involved in ongoing discussions about how we're going to present intros and deep dives and things of that nature. So to me, I just don't want to have more meetings for meeting's sake, especially when I hear phrases like syncing up. That sounds like airtime. And, and I, like Tim, already regularly attend a bunch of meetings throughout the week. I view this more as it's the right cadence for syncing up about topics at the right level. So how does, how does this sound as a proposal for doing this? We, I can file issues uh, in the CNCF repo that are generic enough that, that we mentioned last time that I, I could use help with that are generic enough that they apply to everyone who's working on conformancy things on different environments, right? Uh, I'll try to make sure that Sonobui specific stuff lives over there and anything that follows the ET test suite and features around that would be filed here. It'd be kind of weird because they're really E2E test suite stuff. I don't really want to file it in the KK repo because it's just like noise factory, but I'll file them here. So they're, they're pertained to this area, right? Of conformance. That'd be good. And like I said, I'm not interested in phone calls for the sake of phone calls. I just, I was a little confused as to what's going on where, and it, maybe it's because there has been so little traffic on, on an activity that I got the sense that there are things going on that I'm unaware of. And maybe I was just wrong. <laughs> maybe everything was focused on that one. That yeah, one we, we, we were all downing and drilling <laughs> stuff. But, uh, come on. <laughs> Other than okay. that, it was just that talk. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, again, I want to do things like, the, for example, the Sonoboy supporting ARM, right? We did multi-arc in 112, where uh, all the conformance test suite now works again, ARM and other architectures. Now I want to do the Sonoboy plus ARM. So people who are testing can do that too. Uh, and I want that to be you know, part of this group, um, if there is people from here willing to do the work, that is. Okay, so um, sounds like you know it's we'll, we'll stick with what we got. We'll, we'll keep meeting once a month. I, I, I think if I can get more clarity of when this group is going to go get approval from SIGARC or when SIGARC is going to say, oh, this is time for the conformance folks to get involved and get their approval, and uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I think that will help me in the future to kind of get a good feel. I, I think it was more of just a, um, oh, they're discussing that over there. Did not know. I mean, I mean, there there were examples. I mean, of things that 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 
you know, right or wrong, it, it felt like, oh, the hey, if that's where the discussion is going to be, well, that's the meeting I'll go attend. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But it was just, I, I think that was part of poor, you know uh, Doug's point of, wow, I kind of thought that would have been over here. And okay, it's not, you know, but let's let's go figure it out. But as we're going forward, I think trying to understand, you know, the cadence of when the conformance needs to go to Cigarc or the Cigarc thinks they want to get the, 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 the conformance's input on something as we decide to, to do another really, I, I think that's, just the confusion people have. Does that seem like a fair way to kind of wrap that topic up? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we can, um, and, I'll, and I'll mark them the thing. We'll stick with that, um, and I'll mention, hey, let's 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 see if it's clear for when you know one group is going to the other, um, and that hopefully that helps with the interlock. <laughs> Uh, the, the next topic uh, is, I think, that we were covering was this, the status of a Git repo and issues to track outstanding work items. Tim, you had alluded to that just a few minutes ago, I think, correct? Uh, I started writing an issue inside of the CNCF conformance uh, repo. And the problem there is that I don't, it doesn't, I can't reference and label all the things I want to. So I'm actually writing an issue inside of the KK repo and adding the team and adding the conformance label. And I'm going to see A or B, which is cleaner. Okay. Yeah, I, I like you using the main KK repository. It's already, it's not like, it's already drowning. So a little bit more is not going to it, hurt. As long as you have the label and the right. team, that's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, also, I was interested in trying to figure out how are we with the uh, things that, for example, Hippie Hacker is leading here uh, with increasing the coverage or, or things of that sort. That's why I showed up here. Yes, I don't, I personally don't have much that I can share there, but I think Hippie, because I think Hippie sort of subsumes some of the work that I've been doing in the background for the past month, like making sure we get uh, audit logs automatically generated on the conformance test grid and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But I did, I, I, like I forget if I mentioned it last meeting, but I know I proved it with a PR. I, I submitted to, to Hippie that like, now that we're not counting deprecated fields as part of API coverage, our API coverage is looking a little bit better. And I have numbers that can prove that we did more in Q3 than we did for the past three quarters on raising coverage. Nice. And uh, Hippie, you had some PRs for uh, for sending things in the HTTP headers. Uh, all that gotten, there's nothing left to be merged. Um, I'm still experimenting because uh, getting the data where we can all have different analysis processes in it really required a change in where that data goes. And once we started having the, um, I, I can go and transition into the updates. I guess is kind of answering your question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, the the so we'll back up just slightly um i didn't get to present last time um, but user agent um instead of doing the really in-depth stack trace and embedding that inside the uh, user agent um, we decided to simplify that to be the string of the test so now it's not in the ui but it will be soon where you can drop down and see for an individual test, EDE test, what endpoints did it hit? And um, a little bit later, when we start combining together the work um, that Catherine is doing, you'll be able to see what lines of code um, on the client side and on the server side, hopefully, that a particular EDE test is hitting. Um, and those will be, that, that's, that's a meaningful insight, I, I, I believe. Um, uh, and then past that, I, I Drop the link, but I haven't had any conversation on it. That we had a, um, a UX UI designer come in and create some uh, some possible um, UI updates. And I just, if you're interested, let me know which ones are prioritized because it's it's not something we focus on until we have more data. Um, but if there's something in there that looks interesting, let let me know. Um, that's in the the project the UX area for API Snoop. Um, also, we uh, I think we presented to Sig Testing. Um, but, and it's, it's, it was interesting because it was just moments before the call that we started going, oh my gosh, all the data is available in test grid finally. And so we manually pulled that in and was able, and were able to show that increase in coverage, um, for the different, uh, 1.9, 1.10 and, and so on. 
Um, <clears throat> the interesting things around the uh, user agent being there for the test obviously won't be there until um, like 1.12 and later, I believe. Um, but we'll find some way to, to kind of put that together. Um, and this is where this, this big long list of, wow, we are now pushing data via Proud Jobs to Test Grid, via Gubernator to GCS, and that's just beautiful. Um, currently, uh, I'm looking at bringing in conformance all and having the drop downs dynamically allocate from the, um, the test grid definitions so that we can pull in the latest and possibly the, or we need to kind of chat about what, what we want. Um, the audit logs being available, obviously, via that, what is that possible? We're, we're looking at processing those all in, in Node so that we can do it all in browser, possibly, where you're, if you want to do new UI stuff, you can just pull out, you know, check out API Snoop, pull up an instance, and you're pulling the data, and, and you can do your own thoughts and processes and renderings or, or analysis. Um, it's not there yet, but Catherine's code uh, and, the, and the coverage stuff um, is in the middle of, of getting a proud job, and I am so excited to have that available um, to start looking at. Um, uh, we're also going to, instead of pushing the backtrace fucker papa stuff via the user agent, I think we're going to try to do matching it with the um, audit. So you got your audit header um, and the audit, uh, the audit ID. So each API request, you are going to pair that with um, some type of data getting dumped onto the, um, the node, and we'll put that into GCS so that we can do post uh, analysis on that and have lots of different approaches. Um, so the API snoop will, again, pull all of these things together um, and from a checkout so everybody can start participating in creating new visualizations and different approaches to stuff. Um, all of this so far is focusing on Kubernetes and the ED conformance suite. Um, but what would be really interesting is to start applying this approach to um, lots of different applications, particularly those within the CNCF, uh, where we allow them to continuously generate um, this style of logging, whether it's integrating Catherine's approach uh, or integrating IPI Snoop's um, uh, Faka Papa stack trace stuff. Um, what's going to be really cool is we can start using this uh, uh, this large set of data to start looking at pattern recognition for common use cases for Kubernetes, both on what client libraries and what lines of code and what overlaps on client and server side and which which groups should be talking to one another and which groups um, we could possibly refactor some things. Uh, and, and then, of course, the big thing here within our group is uh, possible guidance for writing um, uh, tests. And so when we start seeing these patterns, not only will we see, um, identify the patterns, possibly with machine learning or, or other, other tools we're gonna apply, um, but we could probably generate tests that, um, and I, I don't know, we need to actually get the data to do it, but that's, that's kind of the, the dream. Um, and uh, open that up for discussion and the questions. Uh, so, sorry, who, somebody else was talking. I was just gonna say, did you wanna give a demo sometime? Because uh, let's describe a lot of cool stuff. Uh, sure. Um, I think a lot of this, like the UI thing is there, uh, and it's, it's not much more than going to API snoop.cncf.io. Um, and if you click on the drop down, all of it's manual and it's not all in GitHub yet because we had a transition, um, in staff. So we have, um, and now we're, we're refactoring that. Um, I've got Zach Mendeville who's doing a refactoring actually this week. Uh, so that it will be inside the API snoop repo and pulling the data from the, um, uh, from GCS. Uh, I think part of it has been syncing together, like creating the data. So we've gotten really intimately familiar with test infra and um, kube test and all the various ways to spin up clusters. And I, and I realized it didn't scale for me or the API new team to try to be spinning all this up. We needed to, to offload that and yep. Uh, it's a quick question here. So we are just talking about the end-to-end -end tests making calls to the API server, right? Yes. Uh, and not any of the interactions between the different uh, Kubernetes components. Um, so with the, with Catherine's code, it is capturing those interactions. And when the different components are talking to one another right now, we're missing the stuff for- GRPC. Uh, not GRPC, for, for, for like back to, what, I forget exactly how it's architected, but the, the node itself, right? The yeah. communication back 
um, I think I would love to find a way to include that information um, with like, because we don't have audit for that, but there's something. Um, and we should find a way to, you know. So here's a concrete example of where we could file an issue. The, the audit was pushed out of 112, the dynamic audit log capabilities, but mm -hmm. we're absolutely trying to push very hard to get dynamic audit log enabled for 113. And if we want to, and if we want to add that as a feature for part of the conformance submission is to have that as part of it. I don't know what exactly we'd do with it yet. Uh, we could mine it, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like gives you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It could give you pathological behavior. If you're trying to diagnose problems. Um, but we could absolutely, you know, have a feature request that we could submit to enable it as part of this submission. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, enable it for a Sonobuoy run or for put it somewhere inside the test automation. I don't exactly know where it would live uh, for upstream stuff, but, you know, we could figure that out. Um, but that's, I'm an really that's an example mm -hmm. of something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm excited yeah. for, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, this, so this is the sort of stuff that like I haven't had time to give. Um, a sufficiently in-depth update or like I didn't have anything ready for it by this week. I will probably have something ready by next month uh, where we'll walk through not just this but we'll walk through when Ippy was referencing Catherine's work. She's done a bunch of things. Uh, one is an alternate view of the the rings of color that you see generally into something where you can drill down by group and table to see specific API coverage for uh, specific endpoints and then like we talked about uh, last month, the idea of looking at code coverage or line coverage as a proxy for progress, as opposed to API coverage as a proxy for progress, because we're, we're getting close to about done on API coverage, at least for pod related things. Um, but even like this circle graph, while cool at the highest of high levels, doesn't necessarily give me actionable uh, what are the pod API endpoints that aren't quite covered? If I download a CSV and do some analysis, or if I look at an alternate table, I can I can drill into that. So that's sort of the direction that this is headed, and I'll be talking about next month. Okay. And I'm really really glad Hippie is leveraging the the conformance uh, test grid thing. Um, that, that was sort of my dream to make sure that we've got like. We've got instructions on how people can continuously run conformance tests for their cloud provider of choice. And so today we've got results from Baidu, or we, we're still working on Alibaba and Baidu, I think, but Baidu, DigitalOcean, GC, uh, OpenStack. I think, I thought Gardner was around here somewhere. They may have dropped out. Uh, but I, I really, to me, conformance as a one shot PR submission is neat, but I don't trust it as an engineer. I want to make sure that it's actually continuously passing all the time, especially as patch releases get rolled out. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. yeah, but that's up to the provider to determine. That's one of those boundary lines because people have built correct. their own automation. That's totally up to them. Right? Yes, correct. Um, Hippie Hepper, did we have another topic here to cover, or is this a new someone else's topic uh, about the expand including CAPEX and data analyze? It's all together, right? Sure, I, I kind of went through it, but um, yeah, where we're we all focused on um, on just the conformance suite, being able to know how we what we need to write next and what those tests might look like would involve actually engaging with the community at large um, and seeing what other kubernetes api consumers um, are you doing and using and if we apply the same same process to uh, i would say let's just grab all the cncf tools as one 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 thing all those projects and, and see what endpoints they're hitting in the and the ways that they're hitting it particularly looking at the stack traces and using that data to see, wow, there is some really common patterns over and over again. And not only do we have the source code for how all those applications or anything similar, we could probably auto-generate at least a framework for people to, to go through and, and, and write a test. I'm not saying auto-generate and it happens automatically, but suggesting some really straightforward patterns for increasing our coverage um, it, it, to make those tests available. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, 
it's, I think that's what I'm actually most excited about is um, connecting it, even if it's not describing the test, it's saying this application and group should be talking to this application and group and this group within Kubernetes and then and finding to, to encourage the conversations. Um, yep. Okay, cool. That's excellent. Um, are, are we ready to move to Srini's topic on the agenda? Okay. Srini, go ahead. Yeah, but before that, uh, I have a question on uh, um, the, the thing that we decided uh, in this meeting about moving all the work items, all the issues into KK back with the proper tags. Um, so Tim, um, I've seen that uh, the one you created just now, uh, is it going to be like a, we assign a SIG to and uh, move all the existing issues from the CNCF repo back to KK or? I don't see a need for, sorry, <laughs> Tim. Okay, yeah, Tim is back. But uh, I thought you, you were uh, doing something else, Tim. But, yeah. I, I'm filing an issue, go ahead, Doc. Okay, so the way I was seeing it was uh, for people who find the Git repository for conformance, if they have to file an issue, we'll still, they'll still go ahead and do what they usually do is like, you know, I saw a repo, I go create an issue that I think is relevant to that repository and do that, right? So this, what Tim is probably doing is uh, doing the backlog that we all jointly need to work on, um, uh, you know, in improving the common pool of stuff that we are gonna uh, reuse and, uh, you know, shape into the, the program that we are running here, right? So that's, that's why it makes sense to keep the backlog in the main KK repository so we can show other people like this is the stuff that we expect. This is why we are asking you to do, for example, the dynamic audit logs or whatever, uh, you know, this is the reason why instead of pointing to a, an external repository and trying to do that, uh, it seems better to just keep it in the main KK repository. So I'm, I'm confused. So I'm picking on just a <coughs> from uh, the conformance issue list, uh, missing conformance docs for 110 and 111. I think Aaron opened up that one. If, if we were to open up that issue today as a brand new issue, would it be under the conformance repo or under the KK repo? The conformance repo, because that's where it belongs to right now, right? I don't know, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. So it is related to the stuff which is in that repository. So yeah. Okay. What, it doesn't need to be in the main Kubernetes repository. So that is indirectly my question. Basically, there is work that our group is going to do, which is related to conformance, nothing to do with any of the six. Then um, that's why I was saying that our group needs to be into two pieces: one doing the work for outbound, and one the inbound stuff. Okay. which is actually trying to do stuff that'll, that we need to work on for the next release. So, I mean, to be honest, it's probably gonna span repos, right? Like the backlog is not gonna have a canonical location, just like Kubernetes, Kubernetes doesn't have a canonical location. It's got many repos that and the data is split mm -hmm. across a ton of that stuff. So if you try to file docs updates, it goes in the docs slash website repo, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, for KubeADM issues, it goes in the KubeADM repo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the thing that we should probably do is, uh, as part of maybe the next meeting, the next time we meet, is to have a list of these different backlogs and identify a key stakeholder to just basically walk through the details of what's in those backlogs and if anybody's going to volunteer to uh, jump on the hand grenades that exist uh, to get the execution done. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, you've got a backlog and there's there's items there and there are items you're aware of and items that need to get done. And then at the same time, you've got uh, the, the, con the conformance repo where if somebody wants to go open up an issue, that might be a little more user friendly from an external facing point of view if it's just a purely conformance related issue. Is that kind of how you're thinking about it, Tim? Yeah, you could also use the CNCF repo as the parent mm -hmm. and then all the children get federated across the other repositories. So if you wanted to say an umbrella would be like, you know, 
make end-to-end -end tests cleaner or something, it could break down into several issues. And, you know, that could be federated across that and sure. make the docs better, another generic thing, which could be several issues filed against it, referenced. Okay. Does that answer your question, Srini? Yeah, it kind of makes sense. I mean, um, like one of the examples is uh, right now, we going to uh, enhance part spec tests. And uh, um, in that case, we should have a tracking item at, probably at the CNCF repo level, and then have individual uh, ETE related uh, issues or into whatever the other SIG it will go into, right? So. So like another great concrete example of an issue that like I have with the docs, but I don't necessarily feel like following in this repo is the fact that the code that walks through all of the conformance tests and tries to parse out based on the Golang abstract, abstract syntax tree, whether or not it is a test worthy of being con worthy of being picked up to be listed in that conformance list, checks if everything is a string, which means that we can't use table-based tests to iterate through and, and define conformance test cases for a variety of conditions. So we need to figure out how to reauthor and re-architect tests to fit that pattern, whether we mandate that conformance tests must always be described with a single string or whether or not we need to update the, the lexer, parser, whatever you want to call it, um, to right. figure out a different way of deriving the metadata and documentation information. And that to me sounded like it was just sort of too fine grained for this group to hash out a lot, but it'll be, Doc, it's documented in KK issues and tagged as area conformance right now. Right. Yeah. That's uh, uh, yeah. That's tangential. Uh, but the problem that I, I actually when I discussed that with you, Aaron, I I did do some experiment on that because I believe that we still have to build some of these tools by ourselves. Um, although that's. Uh, uh, that may be somebody else's uh, responsibility, but um, like um, uh, generation of this conformance doc is something that we took on and uh, the parsing the yeah. test probably makes sense in a way. For I would view it as, as similar to this group iterating on and deciding to use Sana Boy as the recommended way in its documented submission process for conformance results. Um, similarly, this group wants to find a way to automatically generate documentation for all of the conformance tests with dis written descriptions of what it is that they do. And so right now, they have tapped an engineer, Matt Liggett, to write this hand-coded tool, and then you helped him out, Srinivas, and that lives in Kubernetes repo, but it could be that the ultimate final solution would better be suited to, to be like something some other vendor provides or some other out-of-tree tool or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah, um, could be, but um, currently the approach we took is we we do some um, tooling, uh, which we I don't think we can get away without doing some tooling around to make the conformance uh, work progress. Um, this is one of the examples of such tooling. So. Um, yeah, uh, to answer your actual question that, you know, it's, um, Brian Grant also commented in the architecture meeting that we should keep it um, at the individual test level uh, parsing rather than if there are table tests that uh, you need to group and have uh, uh, conformance documentation at the test level. Um, I did yeah. live with it a little bit, but it is harder to do with syntax parsing. It's not runtime parsing, so. Yeah, I was just trying to use that as, a, as another concrete right. example to exactly. illustrate. But those kind of the problems we need to discuss in this group, right, still. It's valid for us to figure out what kind of tooling we need. Yeah, we can't have a single repository for sure. It's gonna spread all over the place, so we better get used to it. I agree with that. I mean, that's not my, uh, the the point I'm trying to say. Uh, how much of responsibility we take to build the tooling. Uh, that's why I said it's tangential uh, discussion, but 
still we need to consider about building some of the toolings by ourselves, I guess. So. Right. Yep. Um, by the way, uh, the only point, uh, if we go on, uh, the only point I wanted to discuss today is automating the process of uh, uh, the um, publishing of the conformance document uh, for each of the releases. Uh, essentially, the idea that uh, I briefly discussed uh, with Aaron and then I went on, um, the idea is to, to generate the conformance document as part of the quick release step. Uh, and uh, it will be placed as part of the tarball, Kubernetes tarball that will be released only for the major and the minor releases, because that's what I think we should do and then have a automated PR generated against the CNCF website where this document will, will go. Um, I have played with that and uh, we can do that. Uh, we do use Go GitHub um, uh, API and we can leverage that. That's used by Test Infra today. Uh, so uh, the document, um, PR will be released for each like 112, 113 um, against the CNCF repo where it will be placed under slash doc, whatever the location we currently picked. I I'm just looking for any comments from the group. If... Um, to one comment, one question. So the question would be like, where is your written description of this proposed way of doing things so that I could comment on I, there. I have opened a PR. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't opened a PR. I have opened an issue in CNCF, so I, I can, I can. This is the automate the generation of conformance document? That's right. Okay, right. Sorry. So it's just like, it sounds like you just rattled off a proposal there and, um, I Typically, I would expect to see that proposal in the get in the in a follow up comment in this issue or a get a Google Doc or something. Uh, the only other point would be make quick release. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the right target because I think that's built for every. Um, I think you probably if you're talking about wanting it done only for minor and major releases, you probably want that done as the make release target, not make quick release. Okay. Right, but then my question is, why do we actually need to do that? Can we, uh, because all the artifacts are available um, in various places uh, that that are generated by the release process, as well as uh, you know, we all we also have the Git repository branches and tags. So why does this actually have to live in the make release or make quick release? Um. This is an artifact generated on top of uh, um, the normal build process. So conformance document is generated. Um, is this so already in uh, for 112? No. It's no, not. it's not. So it's not going to go in 112 for sure. No, it's not no. going to go into 112. Uh, yeah. it, uh, for now, what we are doing is we are manually generating the conformance document and pushing it out to CNCF website, right? So I'm proposing an automated way of doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, we have publishing bots uh, kind of scenarios where uh, we, we work on repositories and we generate artifacts that go elsewhere, right? So, so we can use that pattern and, you know, we have the list of releases and the, uh, that we need to generate this for. And if we find a new release, then we'll, uh, you know, the bot will wake up and yeah. do right. something like that, right? So it sounds like I, I got to run shortly. Yeah, we got to get out. So we should iterate on in a proposal. So if you can link that and maybe CC Dims and myself. Srinivasan. That's good. Perfect. Thanks. And on that, we are out of time. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye, everyone.